know most of you. Maybe I know all of you. For those who I may not, I'm Jeff Shields for being here at the school. And the importance of this lecture is indicated by the fact that we have not one, but three people who are introducing it before we get to the, uh, the speech. Uh, my introductions will be extremely short. Uh, this is the Norman Williams uh, Lecture. Thank you very much. This is, the, this is the Norman Williams Lecture. It is funded by our trustee, Fran Yates, uh, and we have had uh, a series of uh, the very top uh, land use and environmental lawyers uh, and academics in the country uh, who have been our lecturers, and we have such a person tonight. And I'm not going to go further than that to talk about her, except to say that I know her husband quite well, and uh, he tells me that she's spectacular and I haven't met her before. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunity to have, have some conversation uh, at dinner. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ken Van Roth, who's going to talk a little bit about Norman Williams, and then uh, we will have the introduction of the speaker by Professor John Echevarria. Ken Van Roth. Thank you, Jeff. As the director of the Land Use Institute, and at this point I guess it's a sole uh, inhabitant, I'm <coughs> delighted to welcome you all to the 8th Annual Norman Williams Distinguished Lecture in Land Use Planning and Law, to give it its full title. Norman was a key figure in the history of land use planning as a legal discipline, and in the history of Vermont Law School and environmental law in Vermont. He came here in 1975 after a distinguished career as a land use planner and lawyer in New York City, especially relevant in light of uh, uh, this afternoon's lecture topic, and in New Jersey. Uh, right out of Yale Law School, he began uh, his, uh, nearly right out of Yale Law School, began his professional career uh, as a uh, zoning analyst for the city and from 1950 to 60 was director of the Division of Planning and chief of the Office of Master Planning in the city's Department of City Planning. He subsequently played a lead role in New Jersey's pioneering Mount Laurel decision that, as you all ought to know at least, struck down exclusionary zoning in more or less no uncertain terms and he had worked as a scholar and teacher at uh, Rutgers and Yale throughout his career. His multi-volume treatise, American Land Planning Law, first published in 1974, uh, remains uh, the standard work in its uh, third edition of 2003, which is still annually supplemented. Here, Norman played a key role in the founding of the Environmental Law Center, and in the development of the now defunct planning phase of Vermont's Act 250 and in other uh, state environmental <coughs> issues. He was active at VLS as a teacher until his retirement in 1995, and he surrounded himself with the brightest and best of his, uh, his students. Today, the lecture and our other work at the law school in land use and planning uh, carries forward his vision. Uh, I should add to uh, Jeff's recognition of Fran Yates, the generous uh, donor of uh, the lecture, that uh, <coughs> that gift was in memory of Anya Yates, who uh, was one of Norman's leading uh, students and student research associates uh, here at uh, VLS. Uh, with all that said, now let me turn uh, matters over to John, who will be number three, bat third, and clean up as, or well, no, the speaker is clean up, John, is <laughs> helping to set the table. Well, the uh, first uh, two introducers were very brief, and I'll just be a little bit uh, longer, but not much. Um, Thank you to both um, Jeff and, and Kinman for those uh, eloquent remarks. Um, 
For me, it is a, a great honor and a great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce Vicki Bean, my uh, very good friend and a longtime comrade in arms in all matters relating to land use. She will be delivering the eighth annual Norman Williams Distinguished Lecture in Land Use Planning and the Law, the longest titled lecture we have we offer here for Mount Law School. <laughs> Vicki comes to the challenge this evening very well equipped to say the least. She is the Boxer Family Professor at NYU Law School, where she has served on the faculty for nearly 20 years. She's also Director of NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, which is a joint venture of the Law School and the Robert Wagner School of Public Service. Her teaching has uh, focused on property, land use, and urban affairs, and some of her recent courses, which I'd like to take, carry such fascinating titles as The Law of New York City and Real Estate Deals. Uh, she has written extensively on a variety of land use topics, including the takings issue, both in its domestic and international context, and housing affordability. Under her leadership, the Furman Center has recently been generating a slew of reports uh, and studies on such topics as the foreclosure crisis and land use regulation in New York City. She's the co-author with Bob Ellickson of Yale Law School of the leading land use casebook. Um, Vicki has touched all the key stations on her way to her present academic preeminence. She attended NYU Law School as a pres prestigious Root Tilden scholar and picked up a remarkable number of uh, awards on, upon her graduation as she uh, departed the institution. She served as law clerk to Edward Weinfeld, the U.S. District Court in the Southern District of New York, and subsequently for Justice Harry Blackman on the U.S. Supreme Court. So those are the, the dry facts of Vicki's background, which all of you could have picked up by looking at the NYU website, but let me say a few additional things. A less familiar but notable feature of her background is where Vicki came from. She was born in El Reno, Oklahoma, in the central part of that state. At the age of four, she and her family moved to Natarita, Colorado, on Colorado's western slope, very near the Utah border. Uh, Natarita currently has a population of about 400 and neighbors a former Union Carbide Company town, which is one of the largest Superfund sites in the country. Uh, Vicki attended Colorado State University, I'm told on a cooking scholarship, is that true? Yes. Which gives you a sense of the range of her abilities. <laughs> Late in life, Vicki's mother, Caroline Bean, was elected to, the, to be the mayor of Natarita, and in that capacity, she confronted all kinds of land use problems. Vicki's continuing allegiance to Natarita and the debt she owes to her mother is suggested by the dedication at the front of her casebook, which reads, in memory of Caroline Bean, whose land use travails, real and hypothetical, as mayor of Natarita, Colorado, tested a decade of law students. The final thing I want to say about Vicki by way of introduction, and which is not apparent from the printed record, is her extraordinary record of service in helping to develop and encourage young scholars in the fields of, fields of land use and environmental law. This has included leadership in the ALS programs designed to nurture young scholars, as well as her work with a number of individual rising stars in the property field, many of them at NYU, uh, and to cite one other example, our Vermont neighbor and friend, Christopher Serkin, who teaches at Brooklyn Law School, who recently showed off his stuff at a VLS-sponsored legal conference. Uh, all law school faculty recognize the importance of supporting younger scholars, but few walk the walk with as much energy and enthusiasm as Vicki does. So I'm pleased to be able to take this uh, opportunity to exploit the podium to acknowledge your service in that regard. So with that, I uh, will turn to the introduction. Uh, Vicki will present a talk entitled Explaining the Motivations Behind Land Use Regulation, New York City's Rezonings of Almost One Quarter of Its Land. New York City is famous among land use junkies like, like Vicki, like me, like Kinvin, like Dwight, like uh, Janet Milne, because it was the first city in the country to adopt a comprehensive zoning ordinance. Since 2002, in what I believe is the city's largest effort to ever to revisit its zoning regulations, the city has enacted more than 100 neighborhood-sized zoning changes throughout the city, 
Vicki has promised to tell us what all of that means for the great city of New York and the rest of the world. So with that, thank you, Vicki. to John, to the Dean, to Professor Roth. Uh, I, having been, ha being married to a Dean, I know uh, just what a hard job it is. So thank you on behalf of, uh, of, of everyone for the hard job that you do. And uh, it's, it's just really a pleasure to, um, to be here at the number one environmental uh, and land use program in the country, um, even including my own. So that's hard for us to, uh, to admit down there, but, um, but it's an honor to be here and, uh, and an honor really to be invited to, to do this lecture. Norman Williams had an enormous impact on the city of New York and really had uh, a tremendous impact on land use law in general. So it's a real honor um, to be here. It's also um, a real honor to be invited by John. I, um, I've been a fan of John's for a long, long time. I think that uh, John's analytic rigor, his thoughtfulness, his honesty, and willing to call it like it is, um, and his just uh, incredible strategic um, acumen about the takings, case, takings cases that he's worked on and the environmental law that he's done has really um, made an enormous impact on the field, and we owe him all a great, de great, uh, great debt of gratitude. So thank you, John, for, for having me. And I also want to say um, it's a pleasure to be back in the room with Dwight Merriam, who is um, one of the, uh, first of all, funniest and uh, most fun-loving, but also just uh, savviest and smartest uh, professors and real lawyers um, that I've uh, ever had the opportunity to work with. So it's a pleasure to be back in the room. So, but thank you all uh, so much for having me. And um, I want to talk today, uh, as John said, about this project that Mayor Bloomberg's uh, Department of City Planning has um, has has underway. Um, before I get into the nitty gritty. I have to um, tell just a tiny bit about sort of zoning 101 because uh, it's hard for me to understand, but I have been told that not all families talk about zoning at the dinner table. Um, and uh, I knew I had done uh, probably permanent damage to my kids when my uh, then seven-year-old daughter told me that her dream in life was to run a bed and breakfast and she had a house picked out that she wanted to use as this bed and breakfast and she wanted to know would she need a rezoning, a variance, or a special use permit. So, so I assume that you don't talk about those kinds of things. Um, so let's, um, let's just talk for a second about um, Zoning 101. So zoning along with uh, all kinds of other uh, land use regulations, building codes, subdivision regulations, historic preservation, and the like really determine who get, what gets built where, right? And zoning typically in its, uh, in its 1916 uh, form coming out of New York typically separates what are thought of as incompatible land uses, so separating industry from family residences, specifies the density at which a use can be built, and regulates the height, the setbacks, the side yards, and other matters relating to where a building can be placed on the, on the lot. So what you see here is on the right-hand side, you see um, one of the two critical components of zoning, which is the zoning map. So the zoning map tells you for every lot in your city um, what can be built there, right? And it is accompanied by a zoning text. So you see on the right-hand side, this is a now very trendy neighborhood in Brooklyn that was a very gritty industrial area. So you see it's a mixture of R6, M1, and in order to understand that, you have to look at the map and then go back to the text and find out what that is. So for example, um, if you take this R6B, you would go back to the text and it would tell you that R6B is residential, it would define residential, and then it would tell you all kinds of things about the maximum floor area ratio, which I'm going to explain in a minute, the building height that would be allowed, and all kinds of other things. So that's what basic zoning is all about. Um, a key concept here is the floor area ratio. Okay, uh, Some people call it FAR, some people call it FAR. 
Um, but basically what it is, is it's the what, how much floor area you can build given the size of your loft. So it's a ratio. It doesn't tell you where you have to place it or how you have to place it. So if you have a 10,000 square foot lot and you have an FAR of one, you're allowed 10,000 square feet of space in your building. You can put it, if there were no other regulations, you'd be able to spread that as a one story building over the whole lot or you could mass it um, by stacking it up in various ways. And it tells you what the total floor space that you can build is. And FAR is um, a very central concept to traditional zoning. Now, everyone loves to hate zoning. They hate it because it makes housing unaffordable, and Ed Glazer has been a, an economist at Harvard, has been on a dog and pony show across the United States telling us how terrible land use regulation, especially zoning, is and how much it drives up the price of housing. Um, others, Norman Williams' uh, work on Mount Laurel, for example, tells us that zoning results in income and racial segregation. It's inflexible, it's slow, it fosters sprawl, it doesn't let people walk so they get too heavy. Um, it discourages innovative design. It is just a terrible thing that everybody loves to hate, except nobody wants to quite get rid of. Um, so, uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. So you have people saying it's ad hoc, sloppy, <coughs> self-serving, terrible adverse consequences, no offsetting benefits. You know, people don't like it, generally speaking, except they always want it, right? Um, so what that has spawned is a huge variety of proposals to fix zoning, um, all kinds of new techniques, um, what are called form-based codes that really focus on the form and the character of the buildings as opposed to just the separating the uses and specifying the uses, performance-based codes that say, well, here's what we want to achieve. You figure out how to do it as long as you meet our goals. Um, proposals to have what, um, what Rick Hills and David Schleicher have called a zoning budget that would basically say, here's how much space we want to have available um, and any deviations from that, that any down zonings, any deviations have to be offset by, um, by increases so that it's a zero-based uh, zoning budget. Or a wide variety of proposals to allow overrides of local zoning. So in Massachusetts for affordable housing, um, is, a, is, is one good example. Now, my project was really to, say, to think about, well, how do we think about all these different reforms? One of the key elements that we need to think about here is what motivates land use decision makers? What makes them tick? Why are they doing, making the choices that they're making? And there are a variety of theories out there about why land use officials act the way they do ranging from a public interest theory that says, look, they're, they're really trying to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number of people, to enact a system that will rationalize and make efficient uh, the land use pattern. Others, uh, under, a theory of, uh, under theories of public choice, say no, they're trying to maximize their chance of getting reelected or of, making high, of, of being appointed to a higher office. And so they're influenced by whoever they think can help them uh, get to that, to that goal. And the theories then divide on who they think is most influential. So the growth machine would say it's the um, business elite who wants to grow the city, who you know, wants to bring capital in um, and thereby increase the values of their property. Uh, others say, no, no, it's the homeowners that uh, this theory calls the home voters. Um, others think, no, it's really all about racism and classism. Uh, some think it's all about what we call fiscal zoning, an attempt to attract uh, taxpayers who pay more in taxes than they consume in services. And then there are theories that kind of combine uh, some of these other theories. So what um, my project is, is really to take two of these, the growth machine versus the home voter theory and to try to understand better which one of these really explains land use today. Right? Um, both of them are, um, well, the urban growth machine uh, theory was really put forward in the 70s, the home voter theory um, put forward in the early 90s. Um, 
But the question is, how much do they hold and in what kinds of jurisdictions? Um, the urban growth machine, let me say just a, a few words more about it. it. The theory is really that land use officials are just part of basically a coalition, a coalition of um, powerful pro-growth forces, the corporate headquarter elites, the, um, the landowners who want to see their land values increase because of increased attraction of people and of businesses. Um, and the role of the land use official there is thought to just basically be to serve the growth coalition. Um, the pro-growth bias is thought to really permeate the cultural uh, attitude of the city, the, the media attitude, etc. cetera. Um, and zoning is considered to just be a tool that can be used um, by the pro-growth elite to increase the value of its property. Um, and under the growth machine, poor neighborhoods are considered to be particularly vulnerable because um, they have land that could be made more valuable if they were only pushed out. Um, and so um, they are considered to be particularly vulnerable under, that, under this theory. I want to contrast that with uh, Bill Fischel's um, home voter hypothesis, which, which claims that local land use policies are really driven by voting homeowners, who he calls home voters, and that their interest is always in maximizing the value of their house, which is usually their largest investment. Um, and so they are critically concerned with having public service and tax packages and land use policies that promote and protect the value of their homes. Um, Professor Fischel focuses on smaller suburban jurisdictions, but also claims that this applies in big cities with ward-based land use politics like Chicago. Um, there have been a variety of attempts to test these various theories using regulatory stringency uh, indices and, um, and various other techniques, but the existing literature is a, pretty thin, and B is very limited by its focus on either a small subset of a particular kind of community or on zoning changes that are sought by a developer as opposed to zoning changes that are pushed forward by, um, by the city. So that's the backdrop against which we started to notice that New York was engaged in this really quite extraordinary attempt to rezone uh, the city's land. Not in a comprehensive one shot, we're going to change the zoning as some cities like Miami have done, but in a piecemeal, one by one, neighborhood by neighborhood, um, attempt to rezone um, a, lo a lot of the city's land. Now, a rezoning, to go back to Zoning 101, is basically an amendment. It changes the map or it changes the text. It can be initiated either by community groups, developers, the landowner, or the city itself. Okay? Um, so the city's rezonings, um, these 101 rezonings that have taken place under the Bloomberg administration, have uh, rezoned about 11,000 blocks in the city of New York, almost 25% of the city's land. It's an unprecedented um, effort to rezone any city, and the rezonings are of extraordinary importance. They really determine how many people the city can comfortably accommodate, how affordable the city's housing is going to be, which neighborhoods are going to grow, and whether growth is going to be directed in ways that we would consider sustainable um, and, uh, and, and pushed into areas that are well served by infrastructure. But the thing that we noticed as we watched these rezonings unfold is that a tremendous amount of the rezonings turned out to be what we call down zoning. So they are taking the existing rules and they're making them even more stringent as opposed to very few that, that seem to be up zonings, making the land use regulations less restrictive and allowing more to be, uh, to be built there. That observation, coupled with all kinds of pronouncements coming out of the administration that New York City was expecting, welcoming, hoping for, prepared for a million new New Yorkers in the next uh, couple of decades, made us say, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Could it be 
that the Big Apple is no longer a growth machine as everybody always thought it was, but might in fact be starting to be controlled by more and more of the home voters. The city is, has the lowest home ownership rate of any uh, major city in the United States and many around the world. It's only 31%. But there are neighborhoods in our, especially in uh, outer boroughs and in the wealthier parts of Manhattan, um, where you do have a majority of homeowners, and the homeowners have an enormous amount at stake because property values and the cost of homes is very high in New York City. So we asked, you know, could it be that New York City is essentially acting like a suburb, like Bill Fischel, Professor Fischel, thinks that suburbs behave, rather than acting as uh, uh, Professors Logan and Malach thought the growth machine um, controlled. So we set out to really try to understand um, whether that could be happening, and we looked at um, the 100 areas that were rezoned between uh, 2003 and 2009. Um, I won't bore you with all the detail of how we did this, except to say that in this day and age, we are in um, you know, the 2000s at this time, and we're in supposedly one of the most sophisticated cities in the world. Um, there was no electronic file of any of these rezonings. So we had to take every lot in the city of New York Fun fact, there are 811,000 lots in the city of New York. Um, we had to take each and every one of them and look to see what it was zoned for in 2003 and then compare that to what it was zoned for in 2009 and use that to calculate was the lot um, up zoned, making it less restrictive, down zoned, making it more restrictive, or put into this newfangled category, which we call non-FAR, F-A-R, um, rezonings, which is really um, a form of, we believe, uh, contextual zoning. So what it says is, you can build, what you can build in this area depends on what is already in that area. You have to be contextual. Whatever you build has to fit in with what is currently there. Some people think of it as historic designation light. Other people don't know, including myself, don't really know what exactly that category is all about and what, what its implications are, are going to be. Um, and then the fourth category is that the areas could have been studied, have been designated for study, but nothing could have happened to them. So here's just an overview of, um, of, of what happened uh, in terms of the, of the changes. As I said, there are 811, 666, I'm sorry to be imprecise there, um, lots, and um, about uh, more than a third of them were studied for rezoning. Uh, almost a quarter of them were actually rezoned. Um, and of those ones that were rezoned, about 4% of them, uh, about 4% of the city's land area was upzoned, made less restrictive. Um, almost 5% was downzoned, made more restrictive. And about 15% were put into that contextual category that I mentioned. Another uh, almost 11% were studied, but not in fact um, rezoned. Now, that tells you the number of lots, but that doesn't tell you the capacity, because a down zoning could be just affecting you know, 10,000 feet, whereas an up zoning could provide 100,000 new feet of capacity. So you want also has to look at it in terms of uh, capacity. And what we saw was a net gain in capacity of about 118, uh, 100, uh, about 118 100 million square feet of capacity, okay? 2.1% of the city's land area um, it is what's at stake there. Now, that sounds, 118 million additional square feet sounds like an awful lot, but in fact, it's not all that much. It provides about 94,000 new units at very um, optimistic uh, notions of what can be built. Um, that would house about 235,000 people. But as I mentioned, we're expecting a million more. Um, and the difference between a million and 235,000 is substantial. Um, so 118 million uh, square feet of new capacity is not 
doesn't signal a city that's really trying uh, to grow. Um, but in order to understand well, what could be going on, what could explain um, the kinds of decisions that are being made, what we try to do is essentially um, model, put down on paper or actually on computers, because we are uh, computerized despite the Department of City Planning not being, um, to put down on the computer what we believe a zoning decision maker thinks about and how it is that they decide, am I going to up zone, down zone, or what am I going to do to this law? And it involves things like, well, how good is the infrastructure? What's the existing neighborhood character? What are the trends in the market um, in the surrounding area? What's the city's investment in the area already been? What are the neighborhood demographics? How much political influence does the neighborhood have? And what is the existing um, set of regulations that are at play? And for each of these seven categories, we have an enormous amount of data that tells us about those different um, characteristics. So what we try to do um, is, in, in simple terms, not economist terms, but simple terms, is we try to use all of this data to understand what were the features of the lots that were being upzoned and of the lots that were being downzoned compared to these other categories of not rezoned at all or put into a contextual zone. We try to use the information about what the characteristics were to then use statistical techniques to control for all of the variables but whatever one we're looking at and trying to understand what's the influence right, of a particular variable like the percentage of the neighborhood that is white. Right? Um, and so we take that uh, calculation of the influence that a particular variable has on the probability that something is going to be upzoned, downzoned, uh, relative to not being uh, rezoned at all. And we use that um, to try to understand what's motivating or what's influencing the decision that's being made. We know that there are very huge differences between the characteristics of the areas that were upzoned versus downzoned. So I've, I've given you two examples here. The home ownership rate in, in the city on all of New York City's lots, this is uh, in the tract, which is a slightly different number than what I was giving earlier, is 45%, but in the upzoned areas, it's only 28, whereas in the downzoned areas, it's about 37. And in that contextual category, it's 61%. So huge difference there. Similarly, the number of tracts that are in the very top quintile income-wise, um, only 9% of those were upzoned, whereas 26% of those went into this uh, contextual category. So huge differences in the characteristics by what happened to in, in terms of the rezonings. So what we try to do is tease out, do those differences help us understand the theories of zoning motivation? Because those theories suggest that there will be different associations between the characteristics of the neighborhood, uh, et cetera, and what happens, the outcome of the rezoning. Um, and so our real question is, does what we know about the characteristics of the lots that were upzoned and downzoned help us understand, help us tease out um, this question of the growth machine versus the home voters. So what we have to do here is we have to look at what are the key differences in what those theories would suggest about the association between the variable, the data about the neighborhood characteristics, and whether or not an upzoning or downzoning took place. First thing to say is that even though both the growth machine and the home voter hypothesis are book length uh, descriptions of the theory, and even though too many trees have been killed in trying to explicate those theories, we still actually have very little detail about what they would mean on the ground, which is a problem that often uh, afflicts theories, right? They don't, they're short on detail, um, they don't get in the, into the messiness of real life. And in order to do this project, we had to get down and dirty and try to really figure it out, what does this look like on the ground? 
The other problem is decision making is always a messy enterprise and of course the characteristics never all line up in the same direction so you may get uh, uh, things that are pointing in very different directions that um, complicate your analysis to put it mildly. But those caveats aside, we tried to identify what are um, key differences between the growth machine and the home voter hypotheses that would help us understand what's going on. So the first thing that we thought, that we realized, is that the growth machine is going to prefer growth almost anywhere, but especially in areas that are well served by well-functioning infrastructure and in areas of high demand. Whereas home voters are going to oppose upzonings right, that allow more development um, because it would bring competition by allowing more development in areas that are desirable, um, both because of their amenities and infrastructure and because they're already showing signs of demand. Essentially, home voters act like monopolists. They want to protect the price of their, the, the one good that they have a monopoly over, which is their home. Um, so we would predict that a, um, in the areas next to rail, next to express bus stations, next to parks, that the growth machine would want to see those upzoned, whereas the home voters would want to see them downzoned. So we then uh, run our uh, uh, regression models, and what we see, and I'll, I'll show you how to interpret this in a second, is if you see a number above one, then it means that that variable makes it more likely for something to be, in this case, upzoned. If it, you see it below one, then that means that it makes the probability that this will be upzoned less likely. Okay, so above one, more likely, below one, less likely. Um, and the stars are just telling you that it's statistically significant at the highest uh, level of significance. So what we see here is that if you look at this rail uh, uh, feature, you see that it made, being near a rail station, made an upzoning much more likely to take place, 1.6 times more likely to take place um, than for the lot to be studied but not rezoned. On the other hand, it made the downzoning less likely to take place, right? So the lot is less likely to be downzoned if it's next to rail, okay? Now, what that would suggest is that's supportive of the growth machine model because the growth machine predicts that you're going to see um, up zonings, not down zonings, right? Um, and it helps to refute, in this particular case, the home voter hypothesis. Unfortunately, it would be nice if they all lined up in the same way, but they don't. Um, so we see this anomaly that being next to bus stops and being next to parks makes it both more likely that you're going to be upzoned and more likely that you're going to be downzoned. Okay, so that's a puzzle. Um, and uh, while it supports the growth machine hypothesis, it also provides some support for the home voter hypothesis. And so I'm going to call it a draw. Okay. Uh, in terms of market demand, as I said, we would expect that the growth machine would want those things upzoned, whereas the home owner will want to protect their monopoly, so we'll want down zonings. What we see is that um, in areas with high price appreciation, it's slightly more likely to be upzoned and less likely to be down zoned, as the growth machine hypothesis would predict. But again, um, it doesn't line up as neatly as it should. So we also see that in areas of high population growth and high building activity, we get an increased chance of both an upzoning and a downzoning relative to no uh, change in zoning at all. So again, some support for the growth machine um, model, um, but some inconsistencies there as well. Okay. In terms of another key difference would be the high income tracks. Um, decision makers motivated by home voters are going to respond to homeowners who control votes, um, not just the wealthiest homeowners. Um, while the growth machine is going to oppose up zonings and actually support down zonings 
in the areas that the business elites live in. So the very wealthiest areas um, are going to be protected from all the growth that the growth machine wants for the rest of the city. Um, and so uh, we're going to see the, the wealthiest areas being downzoned um, rather than upzoned. Poor tracks, as I mentioned earlier, are going to be especially vulnerable to the growth machine. Um, on the other hand, home voters are going to want to downzone those uh, poor areas because they don't want to attract poor people because poor people tend to consume more in services than they pay in taxes, which is a bad thing for home values, um, which is the main concern of the home voters. So what we see again is the growth machine would predict that you would upzone poor areas, home voter would want them downzoned. In the high income tracks, we would predict that growth machine would want them downzoned, as would home voters. What we see is that poor areas are much more likely to be twice as likely, uh, two, more than two and a half times as likely to be upzoned and are less likely to be downzoned, as the growth machine uh, would predict. Um, and the highest income tracks also are less likely to be upzoned, again, as the growth machine um, would predict, um, and more likely to be downzoned, as both of them would predict. So that gives us some more support for the growth machine model, but doesn't do, you know, doesn't help us too much in terms of uh, separating the growth machine from the, uh, from the home voter. Home ownership rates, that's what drives home voters, right? Where home voters are is where they are most likely to want to protect uh, in terms of down zones. But the growth machine really could care less, right? They want growth. Uh, if they think they can get it through as long as they control uh, the, the um, uh, political apparatus, which they think they do. Um, and so um, uh, home, voter, home ownership rates are going to be very important to the, under the home voter hypothesis, but not under the growth machine. Similarly, electro, electoral turnout is going to be very important for the home voters because it signals how much power they have over the uh, political machine, um, but irrelevant really under the growth machine theory. Um, so we would predict that we'll see no difference uh, under the growth machine theory, but we will see down zonings under the home voter theory. What we see are extraordinarily large numbers, right? And those extraordinarily large numbers mean that in an area with a high home ownership rate, you, that lot is 81 times more likely to be downzoned than in an area with a lower home ownership rate. So it matters a bunch if that is, if, if this is a home ownership area. Um, it matters as well in terms of upzoning. It even makes upzonings more likely. Um, but the key fact here is that it matters and it matters big time. And that supports very much, very strongly, the home voter hypothesis. Voter turnout doesn't, uh, 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 it's less likely, half as likely, uh, to be upzoned in areas of high voter turnout and about nine and a half times uh, more likely to be downzoned, again, uh, supporting the home voter hypothesis. Now, what about um, race? Um, technically, neither of these theories cares about race. Uh, the growth machine doesn't care. It wants growth. Um, and as long as racial uh, tension doesn't get in the way, it's not going to care about the race of the tracks um, that are at issue. Technically, home voters also shouldn't care uh, about race because they are all about protecting their home values. And unless they think there's a relationship between um, race and home values, which they might, um, they shouldn't care about that. So race technically is a different, a whole different theory, a theory about exclusion and racism and classism. Nevertheless, many people believe that home voters act in classist and racist ways and, um, and try to protect their areas as white, upper, or middle class areas. So we looked at um, the percentage of, we looked at those tracks that were very heavily white, 
those that were very heavily 80 to 100 percent black, and those that were 80 to 100 percent Hispanic. And we predicted that home voters would want those areas downzoned um, so that no further growth could take place in those areas. What we find is that, um, and that, and that the growth machine wouldn't care, as I mentioned. What we find is that race matters. Um, uh, areas that are heavily white are much less likely to be upzoned, um, but so are areas that are heavily black, um, and so are areas that are heavily Hispanic. None of those are being um, upzoned. Okay. What we see, though, is that white areas are much more likely to be downzoned, and that black areas are much less likely to be downzoned. Okay? Which is, um, I mean, it's consistent with the home voter hypothesis that they would protect white areas, but it's um, uh, and it's consistent that they would also want to be um, preventing any further development in uh, in minority areas. They do. Uh, in this case, not want development in black areas, but uh, doesn't seem to matter the areas that are, are are heavily Hispanic. Okay, so I've given you a lot of information. I apologize um, for that. That when you do these kinds of studies, you uh, there, there's a lot. Um, but how do we pull it all back together? Um, I think the results provide some support. Um, for the growth machine hypothesis. They certainly don't show that growth is no longer um, influential in New York City, um, but the support for it is much less consistent and much weaker than one would predict given the what New York City uh, stands for and what it's been all about and given what it says it's trying to do. Um, the results lend considerably more support to the home voter hypothesis um, than one would expect from a large urban area like New York, and especially one, again, um, that's claiming that it wants to attract uh, one million new residents. So while it's messy, I think that the bottom line of our study is that things are changing. The growth machine does seem to be a little bit on the wane on the way down, and uh, even in New York City, we s we're starting to see a very strong influence by uh, home voters, by homeowners. So what does that uh, mean? What are the implications? Well, the first implication I want to say is that the results and the messiness of the results show the difficulty of articulating exactly how various theories of land use politics are going to play out on the ground. And I would like, especially the students, to remember that when you read cases that pontificate about the politics of land use decision making and set rules on the basis of their pontifications about, um, uh, about what drives land use, because it turns out to be actually pretty darn hard to untangle, um, even with incredibly rich data sources um, like I have here, and, uh, and an incredibly broad set of decisions over which to look. So the results should really caution any um, broad pronouncements about local government motivations and instead really push us to recognize that motivations are complex, hard to uncover, um, even under the best of circumstances. Um, Courts should be wary about local government rules. Everybody has always remarked, why do we have local government rules that regulate everything from my town of 400 to New York City with its uh, 8 million? Um, but these really caution us that while uh, they suggest that New York City may look more like the suburbs than we thought it would, um, it's still quite different uh, than Rutland or Natarita or any number of other places. Um, courts should be thinking hard about the presumptions that they use in land use decisions, given the, given the evidence that home voters have considerable influence, not just in the bedroom community, in the bedroom suburbs that they were thought to control, but even in cities like New York. Um, on the other hand, I think the exercise reveals the difficulty of identifying rational rezonings. Right, through a traditional cost-benefit framework. Um, we try very hard to tease out 
when would it be rational for a decision maker to put this next to a congested rail station, an uncongested rail station, and we did all kinds of fancy things to try to untangle that. But the truth is, it's very hard um, to uh, tease out uh, that in any, in any consistent and um, grounded way. The other thing in terms of uh, race I just want to say is that the findings reveal the need for disparate impact analysis because they show just how hard it is to try to understand the influence that race might play in uh, land use decision making or any number of other urban politic uh, matters. Um, in terms of zoning reform, I think the findings lend a great deal of credence to proposals such as Azra Kills and, and David Schleicher's attempts to force land use decision makers to be more transparent and to think about what they're doing, not piecemeal, but uh, in terms of its uh, implications for the city as a whole and indeed for the region as a whole. Um, I think the findings also support or lend support to proposals for overrides of local government decisions on locally unpopular but necessary land uses like affordable housing and, and other uh, things. And then finally, um, I think the, the findings reveal a challenge to those of us who work in the land use field, and that is to think hard about how these new zoning techniques uh, contextual zoning, form-based zoning, performance zoning can be regulated, can be policed, um, if at all. Um, as I mentioned, 15% of the city's land, or about 155,000 lots, were rezoned into these contextual zones that nobody seems to understand. And nobody yet understands what impact they're going to have on the ability of the city to grow. I suspect, but I can't prove based on what we now know because it would require a very complicated um, analysis, but I suspect that that 15% of the city's land that's been rezoned into that category is much more like a downzoning than an upzoning. And if that's the case, then in fact the support for the home voter hypothesis will be quite overwhelming. Okay? So that category, which can't, it isn't understandable in our normal way of thinking about zoning, um, because you can't, you know, can you build more or less? Well, it depends on what's there, right? Um, usually what's there is less. Um, so usually you're going to be able to build less if you have to build in context with what's already there. But that's something that we're going to continue to study as with when and if the city's rebuilding uh, or the city's building takes back up again. Um, but I think that's a very serious challenge that our land use framework, our the way that the courts think about policing the land use decision makers doesn't work under, uh, under techniques like contextual zoning. Um, so I think that's a major challenge. So thank you very much for your interest, and, uh, and I want to thank my uh, team back at the Furman Center, including um, uh, students like many of you who are uh, a joy and a pleasure and an honor um, to work with. This is my, um, my team on one of our um, fun days uh, investigating uh, either a waste dump or a rezoning, or I can't remember what we were investigating. Um, but uh, we had a lot of fun because um, working with students like you is, uh, is an incredible uh, pleasure. And uh, so I want to thank you. So, Todd, I'm happy to take any questions. We have a couple of folks with mics wandering around. And we ask that, that people with questions use the mic so we can keep a record of questions. We have some questions in front here. The mic is approaching. Hi, uh, my name is Pat Barry. Uh, a 1L, so I don't have the vocabulary. This uh, contextual zoning has always struck me from the time I became aware of it as 
a way of uh, homeowners and property owners, especially small uh, holders, to uh, override the designers, to uh, challenge the planners, to maintain the status quo. And uh, it just seemed patently obvious that that's what it is. And when I look at your data, it reinforces that. I, you have a reticence about making a statement like that because you know more than I do. I look at it and I see it as uh, a classic example of the haves trying to preserve exactly what they've got. They, they're not ambitious for more, and they certainly want to, don't want to have uh, uh, anything less. And so they're, they're, they're freezing it in its present form. You don't want to leap to that uh, uh, conclusion. I don't want to leap to that, in part because I'm older than you are, so I've already made more mistakes, and so I've, I've become more, um, more careful. Um, but, um, but also because I can see areas where it, in fact, allows upzonings. Um, so, for example, I, I started out my talk with that area of, of Williamsburg um, and near the Fort Greene area and the R6 zoning. Well, in fact, contextual zoning in an R6 area actually allows you to build higher because it, it takes away the height limits um, and allows you to build at the higher streetscape um, that already exists. Because as you know, New York City tends to be you know, high at the corners and, and less high in the, in the middle. Um, so the contextual zoning actually allows you to build higher. So there are very powerful counterexamples of where it might allow you to build more. And the reason why we really can't study it in a systematic way is that the only way to study it would be to look block by block and imagine what all might I want to build there and then put it through the ringer for each and everything. And even I'm not crazy enough to do that. I am crazy enough to look at 811,000 lots, but I'm not crazy enough to do that. But and the finance guys for the city are crazy enough to do that because that's their tax base. So they're modeling those kinds of things all the time. You know, you know what? That's no. a problem because in New York City, we don't tax on the basis of what you could develop. We only tax on the basis of what is there now. So it doesn't matter um, that you're zoned to build a lot higher if what you have built is in fact not higher, right? So, which, which distorts a lot of our land use policies. Um, but it doesn't allow me to just call my good friends in the tax assessor's office and say, let's talk turkey about Protection. getting with me those data. Um, but because our tax system is based upon um, you know, comparable sales, repeat sales indices, um, and we have very little undeveloped land um, that you, know, you can uh, value in that way. So it's all based upon uh, past sales of what is there now. So it, it just doesn't allow me to look at it. Good idea, but not in my jurisdiction, unfortunately. So. Hi, Vicki. I'm Pat Parento. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Um, now I know why I didn't opt for a career in zoning. Uh, <laughs> I, I decided to study endangered species and wetlands. And, and they're warmer and fuzzier. Yeah, sort of happy I did. But my hat's off to you. Any, any lawyer who's not afraid of that much data is, is pretty pretty courageous. I, I was curious about whether there was anything to be said about the relationship to the, your findings and density and carbon footprint. Any, anything you could say about that? Well, what got us started on this enterprise was the city put out its first sustainability plan. Um, it called it uh, um, uh, Plan NYC, PLA NYC um, 2030. Um, uh, for the IP people in the room, um, we the Furman Center had a um, had a website called Plan NYC, um, where we published all kinds of information about the city, and um, the city tried to steal my name, and we had an intellectual property dispute. So they ended up calling their uh, they ended up calling their um, their sustainability plan PLA NYC instead of Plan NYC because I had that name already. Um, but anyway, um, just goes to show how strange life can be sometimes, right? Um, so they put out this sustainability plan, and they had all these goals about how they were going to build next to 
uh, existing infrastructure stations and where infrastructure was planned and it was going to be just the most wonderfully sustainable uh, and and uh, carbon reducing uh, you know building plan that you had ever seen and we looked at that before we did all of this analysis we looked at well where did they up some and how does it relate to where the infrastructure is and we found that Yes, they upzoned next to uh, transit infrastructure and other good infrastructure, but they also downzoned a huge swath of land that is has the best transit infrastructure in the city. Um, so they're not being consistent with their sustainability goals. Um, and uh, the pattern that you see here it is not a is not the most sustainable pattern um, for sure. So. Um, that you know, that was one of the things that really piqued our interest. Um, now, you know, the city says in response, um, well, uh, the city has a couple of responses to to this study and have been, uh, uh, I think, grateful that anybody paid any attention to them. Like, right? Who would want to um, to know this level of detail about their zoning practices? So they've been. Uh, friendly but reserved about our work. And um, uh, I will just say, I'll tell two vignettes. One is um, that their explanation is that New York City was vastly overzoned, that it was it's already zoned at way, way too high. So wherever they downzoned was just a correction, right? It wasn't, it's not really taking capacity away, it was just a more realistic um, version of what should go there, right? So in their mind, they weren't doing anything less sustainable because they were just making these corrections to all that good work that Norman Williams did in the 1960s um, where he planned for too many people. He planned for 12 million instead of 9 million, and so correcting down to 9 million is, is not a loss of sustainability under that framework, right? The second vignette that really told me that I was on to something is when I first presented some of our findings to the Department of City Planning, I said, look, I'm giving you every benefit of the doubt. I am being as conservative as I can possibly be about you know, what you're doing so that I'm being careful about any charges or you know, arguments that I'm making about you. And they said, well, what do you mean you're being conservative? And I said, well, I'm assuming wherever there's a doubt, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt and assuming that you are creating more capacity than, you know, than the opposite assumption. And they said, no, that's not conservative. We want you to assume that we're downzoning um, more than, uh, than would otherwise suggest. So you know, that really told me that the, the notion here is really is that um, we want we're shrinking the city's footprint down. We're not making it more sustainable by allowing more people in more sustainable forms. We're just shrinking it down. Right. So. Other than the sustainability plan, was there any uh, underlying more conventional type of land use plan that drove the uh, uh, 100 rezonings, or were they just planning as We don't plan, plan in New York City. I'm sorry. Well, we don't that, do was, that. That, was, um, right? that was the answer expected. Yeah, yeah right? we don't plan. Um, uh, there's a, a famous uh, vignette. When those of you who have taken land use uh, law know that um, the standard state zoning enabling act requires that zoning be in accordance with a comprehensive plan, which is a problem if you don't have one, right? Um, uh, and there's a famous story about the chair of the city planning commission uh, holding up the zoning ordinance when it could be held up. It can no longer be held up, but when it could be waved around, waving it around and saying, zoning is the plan. This is the plan. That, you know, me that messy stuff that I had there in New York City's mind is the plan, right? And they don't believe that New York City is susceptible to comprehensive planning, and there is no comprehensive plan. Uh, 
you, I'm sorry to steal the thunder, but I, you use the phrase disparate impact, mm -hmm. and in my reading, it shows applied to labor relations. Mm -hmm. And you're using it with environmental things, and I just Googled it and found that it's the rage right now. Don't you hate students who use the internet? You know, I only like it, John, when they come up with pictures of the places that we're studying and then they show uh, uh, th that I always like. Um, so the reason why I mention that about uh, uh, disparate impact is that, you know, the whole, there's a huge... Uh, set of law, um, much of it based upon Norman Williams' work about exclusionary zoning and the impact of race on, on zoning, right? And um, as you may know from con law or from uh, well, your first year, I don't know when you take con law, um, but uh, the Supreme Court has held that in many areas, under the Equal Protection Clause, uh, you must show that the decision maker intended to discriminate, right? Under the, which is impossible to show, okay? Um, let's be frank. Uh, so under the Fair Housing Act, the regulations implementing the Fair Housing Act apply a, what's called a disparate impact standard, which is that if you can show that the decision has a differential, a disparate impact on a protected class, like a racial minority, then that triggers higher scrutiny um, than, um, it, it triggers higher scrutiny, right? The Supreme Court has recently um, uh, accepted cert, granted cert on a uh, case challenging whether or not the disparate impact standard can be used uh, in, Fair in Fair Housing Act cases. If uh, they were to decide that the disparate impact could not be used, then the only claim that you would ever have about the impact of race on uh, the impact of zoning in terms of race would be a, you'd have to prove discriminatory intent, which you wouldn't be able to do. So it would basically it's a rational, gut. Rational basis review. Yes. Those things. And yeah. the, the thing that I was finding yeah. that's on yeah, I'm going to silence you. You're taking too much time. Sorry, Dr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I'm Betsy Baker on the faculty here. And I know all of my students who are here find this a really <coughs> welcome break from future interests. So. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad to know that uh, even zoning uh, is maybe a little bit better than uh, springing executory interests. Well, unlike that, I, I love this stuff. So, uh, but it's been a long time since I've looked at it. And um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about what home voting means. How do you home vote? Is it by showing up at the planning meetings and making your voice heard? Is it by, I don't know how New York City gets approval of its various zoning plans. So that's sort of a clarification question. And something you said in one of your closing, um, or in connection with one of your closing slides was the need for decision makers to be more transparent. And it got me to thinking, I, there's no way to measure this probably. But could you somehow look at the transparency of the process of the decision making? So is, is, is the growth proponent considered to be less transparent, and therefore there's less trust in the decisions, and therefore those are going down? Mm -hmm. And are the home voters considered to be, in the today's lingo of sort of stakeholder asserting their rights, mm -hmm. uh, is there any way to, to make that part of the metric, is the, the relative transparency or level of participation in each of those groups in the decision making? Um, so that's an excellent and very hard question. I mean, so each of these rezonings goes through what is called ULERP, the Uniform Land Use Review Process, um, which starts at um, the community district level. New York City is divided into 59 sub-areas called community districts. And any rezoning has to start with the community district, which must hold a public hearing. So anyone interested can show up at that public hearing and make their voice be known. The, the, the community board then votes to approve or disapprove of the proposed rezoning. That vote uh, has no um, uh, binding effect. It certainly has an influence, but it is not binding. Um, and then it goes up to the to the borough president, 
and then um, to the city council. Okay, so at each of those stages, there is transparency. People can show up to the hearings, can make themselves heard. Um, usually the community uh, board hearings are heavily dominated by um, the local community residents. The growth machine, under the theory, does its work at the highest levels and doesn't have to show up you know, at night um, at the community board hearings. Um, but how you would measure the transparency turns out to be incredibly difficult. So one thing that we wanted to measure is um, political contributions, okay? And we, we have political contribution data in here. The problem is that when you give a, com a political contribution and you're, you then show up, you know, when anybody Googles you, you show up how much money you gave, um, you give your zip code um, and you can either give your zip code at your place of work or you can give your zip code at your home. Um, and uh, if you're a developer giving contributions, you may be giving them in all kinds of spread out ways, right? So everybody who works in your firm may contribute $1,200 or the maximum, right? As a, so it shows up as Vicki Bean, it doesn't show up as developer X, right, or employee of developer X. So all of that is terribly untransparent, and we really couldn't make heads or tails of what, what was going on in terms of the money giving, which is the one area in which the growth machine is thought, is thought how it works. Um, so we really couldn't figure that out. Um, but the transparency that I was talking about um, with the Hills and Schleicher proposal is what's, what's untransparent is that when you are at a community board meeting and you're considering a particular rezoning of your area, you have no idea um, that this is one of 100 rezonings and that the total effect of these 100 rezonings means that your kids will not be able to afford any apartment in New York City, right? You don't think about that because you don't see the 100. You don't see the cumulative effect, right? It's the same issue as an environmental impact, you know, cumulative impact thing. So what they propose to do is that every year the city has to publish, we are going to allow X amount of building. And then when a community board is considering downzoning, then you say to the community board, well, that's not in our budget. And so if you want to downzone your area, you've got to talk to somebody else into agreeing to upzone their area. And, and that transparency about the fact that what you're doing is affecting everybody else, but you don't see that, is, is the driver behind their proposal. And I, I think our work really supports the value of that. Should we have a drink? Sounds <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, thank, thank you, you again. No, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>